This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. More in a bit about how you can get an extra four months of internet privacy for free. Depending on what kind of Lord of the Rings fan you are, the first line of Peter Jackson's movies is either a fascinating creative decision or a shameless and bombastic display of Tolkien butchery. Part of the challenge with adapting the Lord of the Rings is incorporating a sense of age. Lord of the Rings is a series that depends on conveying the immense breadth of history that determined the events of the next 10 hours you're expected to sit through, back when 10 hours seemed like a lot to ask of an audience. It's not so much that Jackson expects you to familiarize yourself with all the relevant lore, but he does expect you to understand that the lore is there. And in the context of Lord of the Rings, this requires the audience to understand that the world was once one way, but now the, the world, world is changed. Has changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. This line is one of the many pieces of dialogue taken straight from the books, but in keeping with the larger trend in the movies of reattributing characters' lines, these words actually occur at the end of the books, and it's not Galadriel, but Treebeard who says them. Ents are beings created for the specific purpose of protecting the natural world. They're not trees, but they're not as human as the more recognizable races in Middle-earth, clearly meant to act as a bridge between the world of human interpretation and the rest of the natural world. Ents are creatures that were clearly invented with a lot of diplomacy diplomatic impulse, and a lot of romanticism in mind. I think because of that, their inclusion in this little Monsters of the Lord of the Rings series I'm doing might seem a little odd. I honestly don't expect this video to perform especially well. Enter the crunchy granola monster of the Legendarium. No creature in Middle-earth is more available for use in 1970s Greenpeace pamphlets. But don't be fooled. Ents are actually one of the most philosophically important and disturbing creatures in Tolkien's universe. Before I continue, let's take a second to thank the sponsor of this video. Everyone knows how corporate internet surveillance works, right? Companies take advantage of cookies and impossibly long terms of service agreements to harvest your information and sell it to third parties. This may come as stunning news, but Google and Facebook actually don't care about your privacy, and there are currently no meaningful laws in place to force them to care more about responsibly managing your information than they do about profit. In fact, the law as it's written now is basically built to protect data harvesting. What will be the ultimate effect of turning all the granular details of our lives into commodities? We don't know yet, and personally, I'm not interested in finding out. I think it's important to have a say in who gets your information and when. And one of the easiest ways to do that is by using a reliable VPN like Surfshark. Surfshark disguises your online identity by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet, scrambling the data given to both legal and illegal data harvesters, and allowing you to change your virtual location no matter where you are. Just press a button on any of the unlimited number of devices you're allowed with Surfshark and you'll get your own encrypted IP address, allowing you to get past geographic restrictions on streaming services, access censored content, and keep your business away from prying eyes. And unlike a lot of other VPNs on the market, Surfshark doesn't store your information for any length of time, giving you control over your own information without having to decipher pages and pages of legalese. And now viewers of this channel can get an extra four months of internet protection for free. Go to surfshark.com slash morbidzoo for an extra four months off Surfshark and make sure your information stays in your hands. And clear your cookies every now and again, people. Good Lord. Some of you could open a bakery with that hard drive. Treebeard as he appears in the movies is a figure of some contention among Lord of the Rings fans. The problem Jackson had to deal with is that Merry and Pippin really don't have much to do at this point in the story and adapting them that way for the movies given the kind of narrative agency audiences in the early 2000s expected from main characters would have weighed the pace of the movie down. In the books, Treebeard already knows about Saruman's destruction of the forest and Merry and Pippin are basically just witnesses to the Ents' decision to go to war. I'll be the first to say this makes more sense for Treebeard's character. It's weird for someone as ancient as Treebeard is supposed to be to have to have these things brought to his attention by hobbits. But on the other hand, Tolkien doesn't really treat the Ents much better. For such an inveterate nature lover, Tolkien ends the story of the Ents with a disturbing degree of pessimism about the future of the natural world. The new age begins, says Gandalf to Treebeard, and in this age it may well prove that the kingdoms of men shall outlast you, Fangorn, my friend. In the book, the quote that opens the movie is actually part of Treebeard's farewell to Galadriel, a lament that because the world is changing so fundamentally with the dominion of men, he thinks they're unlikely to ever meet again. Treebeard, whose rage at the blasphemous, grotesque treatment of the natural world led his species to single-handedly destroy one of the two main pillars of evil in this story, just takes his implicit demise as the sad reality of things. The natural balance of the world will never really recover. They will never find 
the ant lives. The forest won't stop shrinking. The ants will just gradually die off and whatever animates the forest and all the sacred life it represents will just have to sink into benign passivity and hope that humans have learned their lesson. All respect to Tolkien, but this sucks. It sucks and you know it. Regardless of your degree of respect for the natural world, it is neither logically nor narratively satisfying to position nature as a force with moral agency and overwhelming physical power and then neutralize it back down to a mere matter of landscaping in the 11th hour. But because of Tolkien's approach here, because he's building upon a particular mythological tradition, and specifically the one he saw as producing the culture he lived in, this kind of had to be the case. The values Tolkien promotes have to be inconsistent because the values of the culture that produced him were inconsistent. The thing to understand about Lord of the Rings and its associated lore is that its shape was basically predetermined before Tolkien ever even conceptualized it. While scholars no longer believe he was truly writing a mythology for England, it is certainly the case that when he set out to write this universe, Tolkien modeled Middle-earth, its history, and its values upon forms of storytelling that undergirded what he saw as the English character both as it developed historically and expressed itself in his day. The mythology of Middle-earth is a little bit Greco-Roman and a little bit Nordic, but the two clear biggest influences were the ones through which Tolkien himself experienced the world, Christian cosmology and paganism. The common conception is that these two traditions of belief have little in common. That's true in one sense, and we'll get to that, but there's some crossover in this Venn diagram that tends to get overlooked, and that crossover is the only place Middle-earth can exist. Tolkien was an extremely Catholic guy in an extremely British setting who wove the tenets of Christianity into the creation of his mythos, but he was also very intentional about his approach to the natural world, in both his own life and the world he created. J.R.R. Tolkien was an environmentalist long before caring about ecological issues was normal enough to put on your Bumble profile. Not even for existential reasons. Tolkien died just as the first murmurs about climate change were beginning, so all this nature stuff really is just from the heart. What those in today's business might call pure nature-worshipping, human-hating, radical neo-Marxist propaganda. Stupid Tolkien. Trees don't have feelings. It's the preservation of the West that matters. You'd never know, given the way so many of today's Christians talk about the natural world as some inanimate thing to be exploited and subdued, that certain understandings of Christian doctrine require a pretty strict environmentalism. Tolkien's advocacy for nature takes a lot of cues from Franciscan theology, named for the patron saint of animals who, according to legend, preached to the birds and called every animal brother and sister. The world, under this belief, is ontologically good. Nature has an intentional and specifically positive moral character. All of it, not just the parts that are impressive or useful. Earth and everything in it was created on purpose by God, and not only are we therefore called upon to be good stewards of the earth, but we're also called upon to rejoice in our relationship of responsibility to it, and invited to know and love the world we live in as God knows and loves us. We are, all of us, created perfectly in both intention and execution, and so the job of all natural creatures is to be completely, unapologetically itself. It's a beautiful understanding of the world, certainly my favorite development of the Christian tradition. It's also why the sort of lazy reddit tier interpretations of Sauron as being a job creator, simply creating a workable economy for the underprivileged orcs, is so annoying. Evil places in Middle-earth aren't just unattractive, they're very specifically dead. Dreadful as the dead marshes had been, and the arid moors of the no man lands, more loathsome far was the country that the crawling day now slowly unveiled to his shrinking eyes. Even to the mirror of dead faces, some haggard phantom of green spring would come, but here neither spring nor summer would ever come again. Here nothing lived, not even the leprous growths that fed on rottenness. The gasping pools were choked with ash and crawling muds, sickly white and gray, as if the mountains had vomited the filth of their entrails upon the lands about. High mounds of crushed and powdered rock, great cones of earth, fire-blasted and poison-stained, stood like an obscene graveyard in endless rows, slowly revealed in the reluctant light. They had come to the desolation that lay before Mordor the lasting monument to the dark labor of its slaves that should endure when all of their purposes were made void. A land defiled, diseased beyond all healing, unless the great seas should enter in and wash it with oblivion. I feel sick, said Sam. Frodo did not speak. 
The lifelessness of the earth that Sauron and his representatives leave behind them isn't just evocative set dressing. It's reflective of the literal death he brings upon the land itself and an implicit interrogation of any social system that promises some future perfection while actively and maliciously destroying the one that already exists under our feet. An approach to the world that was becoming increasingly common in Tolkien's day, the worst of which he saw himself as a soldier in World War I. As Tolkien scholar Tom Shippey states, the applicability of this portrayal of industrialism is obvious, with Saruman becoming an image of one of the characteristic vices of modernity, though we still have no name for it. A kind of restless ingenuity, skill without purpose, bulldozing for the sake of change. The Sarumans of the real world rule by deluding their followers with images of a technological paradise in the future, a modernist utopia. But one often gets are the blasted landscapes of Eastern Europe, strip-mined, polluted, and even radioactive. One may disagree with Tolkien's diagnosis of the situation and with his nostalgic or pastoral solution to it, but there can be no doubt that he has at least addressed a serious issue and tried to give it both a historical and a psychological dimension nearly always missing elsewhere. But the expressive potential and good vibes of Christian environmentalism don't make it, or more importantly, the rest of the theology it's associated with, immune to criticism. It's been said many times, and it's worth saying again, that though The Lord of the Rings is sort of spiritually progressive in some ways, it still retains a pretty distinct conservative flavor, which is what makes its aesthetic so available to fascist cringe posting. Tolkien had a very obvious and very mid-century British understanding of what the proper way to be a human is. That's part of what Lord of the Rings as a morality tale is all about. And this very culturally situated way of understanding the world, the fact that this is a story written by one devout Catholic British linguistics professor in the early 20th century, can't help but produce inconsistencies in the way morality in Middle-earth operates. Humans should be free, but preserve certain forms of hierarchy. They should be creative, but also respect traditional practices. They should accept one another, but still understand different kinds of humans as distinct from one another. It's not that the races are better or worse than each other, it's just that different races have their benefits and drawbacks. The elves' character flaw is that they're snobbish about their natural beauty, intelligence, and immortality, and the dwarves' character flaw is that they're funny-looking, stubborn, secretive, selfish, destructive, and obsessed with money. But we graciously accept them into polite society despite all these objectively bad and cosmically determined inborn defects that just happen to align with contemporary stereotypes about Jews. See? There's where Tolkien gets racist. Racism in the form of assumptions about what it means to be a people and ascribing that identity to intelligent design is built into the mythic structure of the story in more insidious and disturbing ways than begging the question of whether orcs have families. Dwarves, unlike elves and men, were not created by Eru Iluvatar, but by Aule, one of the Valar, essentially an angel in the mythical structure of Middle-earth. Basically, Aule did the exact same thing Melkor and Sauron did when they created orcs, but begged forgiveness, so his unsanctioned creation was legitimized after the fact. Ents have a similar origin. They were created by Eru, but only after he was petitioned to by Yavanna, the Vala associated with the organic world, who worried about the vulnerability of nature to the ambitions of dwarves and men. So two entire races in Middle-earth were essentially an afterthought, literally a mistake in the grammar of creation that has to be corrected for. That's kind of a problem if you're trying to present the world as perfect in both intention and execution. There is evidently room for error here, and it's the nature of those marginal areas that Tolkien's other cultural influence speaks to. The Anglo-Saxon paganism Tolkien drew upon in creating Middle-earth, which undergirds a lot of British folklore and provided much of Tolkien's aesthetic of moral goodness, parallels his reverent attitude toward nature. The suggestion from pagan customs is that we are as much a part of the natural world as all the things we so often consider inferior to us, and that accepting other living things as family and fellow travelers, as the elves do with trees, is what allows us to live a truly sanctified life. But that's not where the cosmology of paganism ends. We also have the rest of this diagram to contend with, and it's this part of the diagram that has something to say about the idea that a natural hierarchy can ever be assumed to be at work in the world. The animistic belief that plants and animals have spirits of their own is amenable enough to the kind of Christian environmentalism Franciscan theology represents, but there's also something darker. 
in that conceptualization that Tolkien envisioned, but clearly had some trouble reckoning with, which is the idea that the world may have purpose, but that purpose might not have us in mind. We may, in fact, not be special at all. We may, in fact, not be the world's favorite creature. For better or worse, Tolkien barely ever used what we would now understand as horror archetypes in the physical description of his characters. The horror we typically think of as existing in The Lord of the Rings are mostly Jackson decisions, which makes sense because he's a horror director. The orcs are scary because of the animalistic way they behave. <laughs> The Nazgul are creepy enough to look at, but what made them culturally iconic isn't any quality Tolkien ascribed to them, but the sound they make. <laughs> Tolkien's understanding of evil is very clear. The rules are laid out as plainly in his universe as he understood them as existing in his own life. To be good is to be healthy and alive, complete in oneself in creative and conscientious balance with the world around you. To be evil is to be the opposite of those things. So considering this, I think it's interesting that the only time Tolkien ever really uses horror as a descriptive device in The Lord of the Rings is in his description of malicious trees, the Huorns, which are more treeish than Ents, but can still walk around if they want to. After the Battle of Helm's Deep, Theoden and Gandalf ride into what used to be an empty meadow to find a strange forest has suddenly appeared, where the trees are gray and menacing, and a shadow or a mist was about them. The ends of their long, sweeping boughs hung like searching fingers, their roots stood up from the ground like the limbs of strange monsters, and dark caverns opened between them. The company hears the creaking and groaning of boughs, and far cries, and a rumor of wordless voices, murmuring angrily. As mythology scholar Verlin Flieger points out, this passage represents Huorns as creatures that can vocalize, but not talk. They have voices, but no words, no language. This makes them distinct in Middle-earth, where expressive speech basically functions as a symbol for consciousness and therefore goodness. It's a weird inconsistency in the order of Tolkien's universe that no one can describe the exact nature of what's animating the trees, what's making them so angry and violent and bad. Gandalf himself describes the Hurons as being a thing beyond the counsels of the wise. The trees have grown wild and dangerous. Anger festers in their hearts. Black are their thoughts. Strong is their hate. They will harm you if they can. Tolkien's treatment of the Hurons comes direct from a pagan folkloric tradition, where forests represent things that exist outside established order in ways that are scary simply because they elude all forms of control. In the books, the hobbits are straight up attacked before they ever even get to Bree by an ancient Huron called Old Man Willow. This is campfire story stuff, an appeal to the inherent unknowability that exists under all knowable things. So I think quibbling over the details of what Treebeard is or isn't in a position to know is really outside the scope of the tone Jackson is trying to match, which is the suggestion of some kind of hidden force to which humans have limited access, if it's available to us at all. The narrative metaphor for the Ents in the movie is basically one of centrist inaction. All this stuff is too far away for us to worry about. The Ents cannot hold back this storm. We must weather such things as we have always done. This is not our war. This is a fairly commonplace narrative construction, maybe even a little trite for the stateliness of Tolkien's prose, but it does ultimately give the Ents an opportunity to display an agency that they kind of lack in the book. Rather than quote Treebeard's lip service to the elves for curing them of dumbness, as he does in the book, speech in the movie is presented as a fairly inefficient and incomplete form of communication. The raw power of the Ents in the movies are represented as having been subsumed under their sustained and intentional separation from the rest of the world. Entish, as in the books, is a slow, methodical, thorough, literally long-winded language. The image here is of extreme, deliberate formality, creatures beholden to a very human tradition of problem solving through reasoned debate. But when it comes time to mobilize the Ents, Treebeard makes his argument with a different kind of rhetoric entirely. No! As a 
a fan of this franchise, I'm prejudiced in Tolkien's favor. I'm likely to give him the benefit of the doubt, and accordingly, I think it's probably fair to read Lord of the Rings as implicating the audience as part of the dominion of men, and thereby being as responsible for maintaining the balance of the natural world as our heroes are. The end of Lord of the Rings is the point at which Tolkien announces his job is done, and it's up to the reader to pursue the problems he didn't have solutions for. The Third Age was my age. I was the enemy of Sauron, and my work is finished. The burden must lie now upon you and your kindred. But doing this as audience members requires us to at least question the validity of a universe built with such rigid intention, where everything is as it appears to be, and specific kinds of humans always have the tie-breaking opinion. Despite his love and deep respect for the natural world, the cultural filter through which Tolkien sifted the world struggled to construct it as being both morally good in a way that's coherent to and reflective of human perception, and also threatening threatening, with an independent will that isn't always accepting of human goals or motivations. Middle-earth is a place whose existence, as Tolkien imagined it, relies on managing this impossible tension between perfect prescribed order and the creative bloom of abject chaos. And that's okay. It can do that because it's a piece of fiction. Lord of the Rings still holds immense cultural relevance specifically because its contradictions raise interesting questions about the contradictions that direct so much of our own lives. Tolkien is not establishing some great narrative of history. He's speaking to us, his readers, and his treatment of the natural world, and especially trees, is one of the most interesting, if only because it's one of the most incomplete. In some ways, it could only have ever been incomplete, because respecting the natural world, which Tolkien certainly did, requires intellectual humility. It requires you to admit that human opinion doesn't dictate reality, that no matter what, there will always be mysteries out there in the wilderness, things you can only glance at before you lose them again, creatures that are always just out of sight, but somehow always see us very clearly. Thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Remember to go to surfshark.com slash morbidzoo for an extra four months of internet protection for free.